Okay. So our final speaker for this session is Dr. Katazina Jurowicz. She performed postdoctoral post work at the University of Montreal. And uh, currently she's a postdoctoral fellow at McGill. Her background is in human neuroimaging and neurophysiology. And uh, she studies decision-making processes in human and non-human primates. The title of her talk today, well, you can see it. So <laughs> I'm just gonna hand over the mic. Hello, uh, my name is Katarzyna Jurewicz. I will talk about geometry of value, uh, representation and decisions. Um, and I hope you'll find something interesting in this talk for yourself. So, um, so I think this is one of the key questions in uh, the domain of decision-making. How do we decide what we actually want? And to be more precise, uh, for the, uh, to describe the type of research that I'm going to present you today, um, I'll be talking about the situation that we face when we want to simply choose a movie for the night. So in this situation, uh, we open streaming plat platform and we're presented with the set of offers. So the consensus view is that what we do in this situation is that we quickly evaluate the offers one after the other. And so this is called also a subjective value because of course we <laughs> apply these uh, ratings by our own taste. Um, but the question is, so these ratings make some, sign of, uh, some kind of the scale and then they can be represented on some kind of uh, an axis. And what neuroscience will ask uh, is whether or not we can find a similar uh, representation in the brain, if it's kind of an axis or maybe something else, or maybe it's a different geometry. So early studies show that indeed there's some indication that this might be a kind of a linear axis. So here you can see that the firing rate um, scales with the expected gain, so the value of the option in these uh, experiments. And also uh, linear tuning uh, is considered uh, beneficial for, for rational decision-making. So the decision-making which um, uh, maximizes the reward because uh, linear representation uh, maintains all the uh, proportion between the options and like increase in value uh, uh, causes the proportional increase in the firing rate. So it's a good basis for all kinds of computations and um, all kinds of comparisons. So for these reasons, um, many studies and many models of decision-making assume a linear uh, representation of value in the brain. But what we know from... Um, from daily lives and also for, from studies, is that actually uh, many of our decisions are not actually rational. And behavioral economics showed it repeatedly that um, uh, the decisions are uh, nonlinear and the subjective value, the curve that you can measure in, in people's behavior is actually nonlinear. <clears throat> so even here, if you look at this first picture uh, from the experimental data, uh, it, it's not that clear if this, this shape is actually linear or can be better approximated by some other function, because always the recordings from single neurons is very noisy. And that's why uh, it's important to try to determine if uh, this representation in the human brain or <laughs> in, the, in the brain of other species is uh, linear to try to determine what uh, part of these non-irrational uh, behaviors uh, is due to this kind of representation or uh, what part is due to other factors like psychological, uh, motivational, and so on, right? So what we did, uh, we, uh, we used the so-called menu search task. So this is the Netflix for monkeys. Monkey can explore uh, the offer. Uh, so this is the set of, set of offers, which are masked offers. Monkey has to first look at each at one of the, the uh, white diamonds to learn about the value of the offer. And when the monkey looks at one particular uh, offer for at least 400 milliseconds, uh, the offer is revealed. And this in this red bar, um, the field part of the bar represents the magnitude of the reward that monkey can get by choosing this offer. So in this uh, particular ex example, this, um, this value is quite low. It's not a great offer. So monkey can reject the offer by just looking away. And if the monkey breaks fixation for uh, in less than 300 milliseconds, 
the situation back, goes back to, to uh, the default. So everything is masked and monkeys can uh, freely uh, investigate any other offer. So in the next example, monkey uh, cho chooses a different option and now uh, the field part is much bigger. So the offer is great and uh, monkey can accept it by just maintaining the fixation for 300 milliseconds. And of course, in this case, the, the reward is juice. So what we could see in behavior is that monkeys understood the task well. Um, so whenever the offer was very low, they rarely ch chose this offer. And when the offer was, was high, they were choosing the offer quite often. So we had two monkeys doing this task. And you can see that both monkeys were, uh, were doing it uh, well and, and pretty similarly. It was the same pattern. So overall, for, for the good offers, um, 95% of the time monkeys were selecting these good offers, but you can see that it's not like 100% all of the time. So I'll get back to that later. And when the monkeys were doing this task, um, we recorded uh, single neurons from ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain uh, correlationally and, and causally uh, related to decision-making and evaluation. And we were, uh, so we were particularly focusing on this uh, time period when the monkey sees the actual value of the task and learns about the value of the offer. Okay, so what we saw is that uh, among single neuron responses, there was, uh, uh, there was a big variability between single neurons. So what we saw is that indeed, some responses appear to be uh, linear. So the magnitude of response of single cells uh, was either decrease, increasing or decreasing linearly with the, the offer value. We also saw uh, some neurons that were not apparently tuned for value. But what we've also seen is that some neurons had apparently a curvilinear response to values. So uh, they were best described by some kind of a um, quadratic function. <clears throat> and at the population level, there was uh, uh, roughly equally, there was roughly equal number of the quadratic and linear, uh, linearly tuned neurons. And if we would like to describe or summarize um, the response of the population, what we could do and what was done in the past is to just take average of all the neurons. And if we do that, you can see that, yes, there is this monotonic increase and so there is this kind of a roughly linear tuning for value that we see in the average of the uh, populational response. But uh, this is kind of a big reduction of data. So uh, what we are interested in is rather how the neurons work together than uh, how is the, what is the, the average response for the neuron, right? So for this, we uh, turn to newer method that uh, uh, that represents the neuronal response of the population in the neuronal space. Uh, so here, for each value, you collect the uh, value of response of each neuron, which uh, serves like a, uh, like a, a coordinates in mul multidimensional space. And so for each value, we have the response of each neuron as a function of the responses of all other neurons. And so, uh, did, thanks to that, we don't have to reduce the information and we can see uh, how the po population actually uh, represents the information. And when we did that, so when we do represent the information in this way, we can first see what are just the distances between the values represented in this multidimensional space. And if we do that, so this is just pairwise pairwise uh, Euclidean distances uh, for these uh, value representations in multidimensional space. If we do that, we can clearly see that uh, there is some structure in this data. So uh, for values, for example, for, for low values and uh, in the left corner, uh, if uh, for, 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 for values which are uh, close to each other, like for similar values, we can see small distance. And if the values, for example, here, 25 and 5 in the red, if the values are dissimilar, uh, they're far apart from each other in this multidimensional space. So here we see 
that there is some like for sure there's some shape uh, in this multidimensional space, but we don't know what is the shape. So to know that, uh, we can apply, we can we can investigate the axis of covariability. So we just apply the PCA to rotate the axis uh, uh, of uh, <clears throat> the axis uh, of this multidimensional space in such a way to capture the uh, to, to order and see the axis that explain most variability. An important notice here is that if the representation is actually linear, as assumed earlier, uh, one, one principal component should be enough to describe the entire uh, shape, right? And if the, the shape is more complicated than that, then we would need at least two principal components, two or more, uh, to well describe the shape uh, of our manifold that we'll see. And when we did that, what we saw is that clearly um, uh, there is a curvature in the in the uh, representational uh, shape for the values, and we of course validated it um, in comparison to uh, to surrogate data that were uh, maintaining all the statistics of our data set. We're forced to have linear responses for single neurons, and we can see that. Uh, the first principal component was significant, had significantly uh, lower importance in the case of real data, and the, the second component was significantly higher. Okay, so we established that uh, the populational response is not well described in terms of the linear response, and what are the implications of that? So one major implication is that um, when you try to read out information from this this kind of a shape, um, this can be this can so so if you think about any region that gets information from this shape, you think about the weighted sum of the activity of all, of of these neurons, and so this can be well approximated by a linear decoder. And linear decoder can be just uh, represented here as this uh, uh, straight line. Towards uh, that that gets the projection from the uh, uh, from the manifold. So if you want to project the curved manifold onto the straight line, what you get is the compression at the tails. So uh, so high values were, will be relatively lower than uh, they, sh they they are in the real data, and and lower values are relatively high than in reality higher than in the, uh, in the reality. And we tested this prediction in our data set. So we uh, trained and tested. Uh, uh, we trained and tested the decoder on our data. And as you can see, uh, this prediction was confirmed. So in comparison to identity lines with the perfect prediction, high values are lower than predicted and low values are higher than predicted. The other prediction that can be made from this kind of a shape is uh, for for decoding from only a part of the manifold, when you decode from the part of the manifold, say half of it, there's little information about the other half. So, uh, if you think about our manifold, if you um, just split it into high values and low values and tra train the decoder on higher values, uh, it should not predict well the other part of the manifold, and this is indeed what we observe. So in red, the, the, the results for training only on the higher half of the manifold, and you can see there's no good prediction for the lower half and vice versa for, for the training on the lower half of values. So these were some general predictions, and now I want to go to the, <clears throat> to the key point of this talk. So these were general predictions for reading from the curve manifold, but now we can also have some uh, very specific prediction towards the behavior in this task. And uh, especially it is, uh, it is connected to so-called independence of irrelevant alternatives axiom. So what this axiom says is that when you're uh, choosing between the options, some good options that you're uh, really considering, your final choice of the best, best option should not depend on the presence of other alternatives that are worse and you're not going to take them anyways. But what the curved manifold actually predicts is that if the option is particularly bad, uh, it may influence 
uh, your choice and your choice for the best option may be blurred. And why is that? This is because if, so in a given, uh, if in a given context, you're presented only when, with the part of the offers. And if it happens so that your uh, worst option is particularly bad in comparison to good options, this reminds this situation in which you're decoding from the entire range of the manifold. And so there is big compression at tails. And in the real organism, there is noise. So of course, you might happen to um, confuse the best options if they're close to each other in this case. On the other hand, when the, the worst option is not that bad, then all of the options are kind of close to each other. And this reminds this situation when you're decoding from one arm of the manifold. And actually, um, the representation is not distorted the same way uh, in this case. So of course, we wanted to test this prediction in our data. And so here you can see the behavioral uh, results once again. And in this uh, plot, you can see that overall uh, probability of choosing the best best option is high, but it goes lower in the if the difference between best value and second best value is uh, very small. And it is particularly bad when the worst option uh, in the set that they saw was very low. And the same can be represented as just as a function of the worst offer in the set. And this, uh, so you can see there's this linear relationship to the worst offer and that it was true in behavior or of, of uh, each individual monkey. So by this, I would like to uh, conclude. So first of all, though many single neurons, responses of many single, single neurons were linear, the representational geometry of value appears curvilinear in ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And the, may, the main takeaway uh, message is that though linear decoding is good, offers a good approximation to many nonlinear functions, curvature may warp, uh, warp decoding, and particularly in these regions far from the center of value space. And yes, if that happens, it may have implications to behavior or something else. So uh, we could observe some specific patterns of irrational decisions, and we did observe those uh, implications. So thank you very much. Uh, this work was done at the University of Montreal uh, under super supervision of Professor Beckett Abitz. And the data were earlier connect uh, collected in Ben Hayden's lab, mo mostly by Priyanka. Merta and a um, large part of analysis were also done by Brice Lizer. And uh, this preprint for this work is already available on by archive if you're interested. And also I wanted to add that now I move to the next project at McGill and I'm also investigating decision-making but more directly in just visual domain. So uh, um, researching where and when to look uh, in the sequences of saccades and, and uh, investigating the scan paths in naturalistic visual search. Okay, thank you very much. And are there any questions? Yes, there's one question, yeah. Questions? So um, I can ask a question. So you were showing us how having um, how when the best option and the second best option are close, the geometry changes. So couldn't it be just that the monkeys are not learning actually which option has the higher value? I mean, is this the change in geometry is just because the monkey isn't understanding that the second best option is the second and the first option is the best or so basically what I'm asking is that is the performance uh, kept like at the threshold of 90% for example even in that case so that way we know that the monkey has actually learned the task even when they're, they're close um, yes because if the 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 third, let's say the third option, the decoy value, the worst option in the set is high. You can, so this is comparison like within the condition. I understand that the, the difference between the two best options is small, but even within this set, even though the, all the responses are like lower because 
this is a difficult thing. So this is this uh, factor that you're mentioning that this is maybe difficult to discriminate between those, those options. There is still linear uh, relationship depending on the value of the worst option from the options that they saw in a given trial. Okay, that does Yeah, that, makes sense. Okay. So uh, thank you for your talk. I think we can move on to the next section.